This episode of the Futures Thinking Podcast, I'm talking with Leslie Kern, author of a book, Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World, urban and feminist geographer. We are talking about the future, whether the future is female, feminine or feminist. I'm also wondering why feminist geographer is taking so much interest in the ways cities are designed. We are also wondering if resourceful, safe, accessible, shared and desirable cities are the ones we are really longing for. You are listening to the Futures Thinking Podcast, where we are sharing live conversations with people of business, design, arts, culture, science and nature who are shaping our futures today. I'm your host, Agata Bisping. Hello, Leslie. It's nice to have you uh, at the Futures Thinking Podcast. Thank you for agreeing to be with us here today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here. Um, uh, today we are talking. Uh, we are going to talk about the city, uh, feminism, and city um, geography, feminist geography, and also about the future. And I'd like to ask you whether future is going to be female, feminine, or feminist. Well, I certainly hope the future is going to be feminist because I think saying that the future is is female or feminine doesn't quite go far enough. Obviously, I I hope to see more women in leadership and more valuing of the characteristics that we have considered to be feminine. But to me, a feminist future is one that uh, strives for equality um, amongst all people on the planet. And that is about a kind of a transformational vision that would really uh, change the way we do everything from the economy to how we relate to the natural environment to um, our political institutions and so on. Do you think that will involve many more women? Uh, Administration, uh, many more women as leaders? I think that's a key part of the picture. It's not the only way to make change, but I think we've, uh, we we do notice a difference. When women are in leadership roles, there are often different priorities that are brought to the forefront of government politics. I think people have noticed that even during the pandemic, those nations with women who are in top leadership positions have done things quite differently. And in many cases much better than nations that don't have women in uh, strong leadership roles. And I think that that really says something about the way that based on your identity, you might bring different priorities to the table and can end up governing, especially through a crisis, in a really effective way. Um, You you describe yourself and your profession as a feminist geographer. Uh, why is feminist ge- geographer taking such a deep interest in the way cities are designed? Um, can you please explain what you do professionally uh, exactly and why cities especially uh, are so of great interest of yours? Sure. So my day job is that I'm a university professor at a small institution on the east coast of Canada. So, of course, part of my job involves teaching students in a geography and environment program here. And the other part of my job is as a researcher, as a geographic researcher. And in that part of my job, I've always been interested in questions of power, in questions of identity, and in issues of inequality. And I come at those issues from a feminist perspective based on my own training in women's and gender studies and so on. But I find that the geographic angle adds another dimension to the way that we can start to understand how power works. And if we look at cities in particular, we can start to understand them as places where long histories of inequality, gender inequalities, for example, but also other forms of inequality are really literally built right into the way that our cities are organized, into the kind of buildings and homes that we design, into our transportation networks and more. So as a feminist geographer, I'm interested in looking at cities as places where we can see how these histories of social relations um, have affected the society that we have today and how the spaces around us continue to impact our social relations. But also cities are great places for social change. So as a feminist, I I look at cities as places of great possibility as well. 
Uh, you are the author of the book Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. And in your book, you ask who is missing from the idealized city life. And I am asking if you have found out how to bring those missing back and if you can find who is missing from the idealized city life. Mm -hmm. Well, when we look at kind of the histories that are, are told of cities, a typical history focuses on those who are in power, those who have had the loudest voices, those who have had the most economic impact or the most political impact. And of course, for many centuries, women and, and other people were actively excluded from those roles. They weren't permitted to be members of government. They weren't permitted to work in the public sphere. They weren't permitted to... Uh, publish books or to have their voices heard. So today, when we kind of look back on our urban histories, there's a, a very long history of kind of not understanding what life was like for women, for example, in cities. And we can see that continuing, unfortunately, today, where in many cases, uh, women, people of color, poor people, queer people are very much left out of urban conversations or are seen or are seen as special interest groups or minority groups that we don't need to put to the center. So part of my project in Feminist City is thinking about what if we did center the voices of women and other marginalized people in trying to understand what works about the city and what doesn't work about the city. And that can look like all sorts of things. It can look like actually going out and listening to people, trying to learn from communities and understand what they need, understand what their challenges are. It can also look like increasing the representation of people in different fields like planning and architecture and politics, as we uh, just spoke of a few moments ago. And it can also look like political activism where different groups of people are, you know, taking to the streets and making their voices heard, whether that's through a women's march or Black Lives Matter protests or climate change marches, people taking to the streets to say, we want something different. We want to shake up the power relations that exist in society. We, we demand some form of change. Um. You, um, what is being underlined in your um, in your reflection is that the pandemic, but also like crucial stuff of crucial and of great importance, uh, can help radically reorganize life if necessary. I mean, pandemic is one of the highlights of such um, procedures, so to say, but uh, Black Lives Matters movement, like the protest we have in Poland, those are the sparks of change, the signal that something is coming and something really um, over overwhelming and that the minorities want, want, to, want to be heard, wants to have their place in a society. And um, you also say that changes are ahead in some way but the cities as far as the cities are concerned they are being planned th th 30 years ahead which means that if we want to implement the change we need to think now and design now something that is going to be implemented within 10 20 and 30 years in the future the, which means that we need to have now people that will make decisions on how those cities are being planned do you have any th feelings or experience how to make such bold decisions? Like you, you claim that if we would def defund police, then we would make money to find uh, resources or the money to make cities more accessible and safe. And in this way, we would not the police to cover the city for safety, for example. And do you see such change coming that we would have women making decisions on how the cities should be planned? We had Jane Jacobs almost a century ago that would, you know, have a, a little say in how cities should be planned and designed. And since then, there is a very few women that we can list as urban feminists that would really make an impact on how, on how cities are designed. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how, what is your view on that matter? Mm 
Well, you raise a really great point, which is that the built environment is this um, very durable type of environment. It lasts for decades, if not centuries in many cases. And what that means in the present moment is often that we are living in the past. We're living in an environment that was built for a society of 50 years ago, maybe in some cases, especially in old European cities, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, you still have some of the same infrastructure. And of course, society looks very different now. So we have this challenge in the present moment of how do we imagine something different when we are still dealing with the uh, urban design in terms of where our homes are, what workplaces look like, what our transportation networks are designed for, that was uh, a legacy of the past. And so your question of, okay, so what we, in this moment, we also have to be thinking about the future because we know that the changes that we want may take decades to come in the future. So I think you're right in pointing this out. It's hugely challenging. It's hard to make immediate changes in the built environment. At the same time, that's not an excuse just to say we can't do anything. There are a wide range of small scale kind of immediate low hanging fruit changes that I think can be made. And interestingly, the pandemic, I think, has shown that when there is a need and a political will, some changes can happen quickly. So, for example, governments can act to uh, stop evicting people or to put a freeze on eviction so that people don't lose their home. Governments can act to find housing for homeless people. Um, governments can act to change public spaces so that people can go and socialize more safely outdoors than indoors. So we've seen uh, many cities create uh, bigger pedestrian areas, for example, and close off roads to car traffic, create more bike lanes so that people can move around without being on crowded buses. And these things happened almost overnight in response to a need. So I think that has shown us that when we really want to make uh, certain kinds of changes, we can. But looking more long term into the future, I think that for having more women involved in these kinds of decisions will probably help us to think about different trajectories, for example, for housing, as we've recognized in many cases that the single family home is uh, kind of a, a challenging form, again, relating back to what was maybe the norm 50 or 60 years ago. But most people don't live their whole lives anymore in a, a nuclear family with two parents and children. People live in all different sorts of housing configurations. But the kind of homes that we build don't really reflect that. So maybe if we want to think what will housing look like 30 years from now, we need to think about what will the family look like 30 years from now? What kinds of relationships will people be living in? And I think a feminist point of view is an important one there, one that can bring in the reality that um, women uh, and men don't stay in marriages the way that they used to. There's more queer families, blended families. Uh, single parents and single people. And of course, people are living longer, especially women. And, and that's a, a concern as well to think about housing for an aging population. So having um, more women involved in these things, I think, can change our mindset a little bit such that we don't just keep building for now, which will then be out of date by the time we get into the future. Um, why, why there are so few women in urban planning and in architecture, whether it is that we are afraid that we are not good enough, we are not wise enough, whether we are being told that we are such, whether, I mean, I think that I figure that only the only um, ground line for making decision who is planning something or who is designing something are only the competences, competences that someone has and gives forward saying, okay, I'm competent enough to have it designed, to design it, and this is my point of view. Why is so um, so few people, so few, <laughs> why is so few women in architecture and city planning? Mm. So I was looking up some information about this in the American context for a presentation that I was giving recently. And in terms of architecture, it was quite interesting because about half of architecture students in the U.S. are women and half of 
graduates with a with an architecture degree are women but only about 20% of licensed architects are women so something is happening between education and the the profession that is either pushing women out or women are not working as licensed architects now i'm not an architect so i don't want to make too many assumptions but architecture is a profession with a long history of people working incredibly long hours for example which is not always hospitable hospitable to people who have children and caregiving responsibilities which still tends to fall on women i think architecture with its history of being so male dominated might not be a very friendly um profession for women and in terms of the kind of funding and um projects that that people are granted a lot of that has to do with your star power and so on and i think uh, assumptions about gender and competence and so on probably play into that um in ways that negatively affect women and may as i say either push them out of the profession or keep them in lower status roles in the field when it comes to urban planning in the us about 50% of urban and regional planners are women or just less than 50% so i think that probably shows that there's been an increase there over time which hopefully over the long term maybe has some impact on the kinds of priorities that planners bring to the table but of course a lot has to do with how you're trained and what you're trained to do and to look for and if there isn't a gendered perspective or a critical kind of perspective on on inequalities in urban space that's built into planning education then it maybe might not matter that much whether you're a man or a woman sitting at that table if you haven't been taught to look at things in a different way so i think it will be interesting to look to the future and and to see as uh, numbers of women increase in these professions whether some changes start to happen but certainly as i've been talking to planners and architects about my book often young people will say oh i wish i'd read about this in school i wish i'd heard more about this when i was in architecture school or when i was in um, my undergraduate study so i think there's still a lot of space for um, more perspectives to be brought into the classroom uh it is um uh, it is astonishing so to say that uh for example if you are a woman you kind of need to read about women perspective being brought to architecture not being able to think for yourself and this is me saying this really mm, uh I, fully aware of what i'm saying that uh, you you just need to kind of think of what you are missing being in a city if you are a woman um big the toilet big uh, the way you need to park with your family or uh, having a um a stroll with your baby in a prom and trying to you know uh navigate through the streets <laughs> with cars or getting on a bus and uh this experience should be easily brought to how to design the cities uh for everyone basically or um but you are right this needs to be put into uh, the curriculum i guess in order to be envisioned envisioned as necessary and doable and do you know any feminist cities already or do you know how they are being planned or if there there is going to be more feminist cities It's a great question. I think if I knew that there was a feminist city, I'd be trying to move there right now, <laughs> <clears throat> set up set up my own life and home there. I think it's probably too early to declare any particular city a feminist city, but at the same time, there is some hope on the horizon in that uh, several cities have taken on what we might call gender mainstreaming or a, a gender equity planning approach. So this involves <clears throat> creating sets of guidelines for decision making when it comes to planning, you know, where are you going to locate a new school? What new bus routes are going to happen? How are we going to design a, a park or how are we going to redesign existing urban spaces in ways that would improve gender equity in those spaces? And a lot of what that involves is consultation with people in the community, so actually listening to people about what their experiences of spaces are doing walkthroughs of different neighborhoods with uh members of the community to say okay what what feels safe or unsafe in this area 
or what are the services that you need that are lacking here or what spaces are inaccessible to you if you are elderly or use a wheelchair or have a stroller or have small children with you. Those sorts of questions that come from the micro everyday embodied experience of moving through the city, not looking at it from a top down perspective as a planner. So some cities that have been working with those kinds of plans include Barcelona, which has a, uh, a, a gendered urban guideline set of guidelines that they are using to try to improve a variety of public spaces. Um, Vienna has used a gender mainstreaming approach to create whole new neighborhoods where, for example, all of the streets and public spaces are named after women and where female architects designed the uh, new apartment spaces to create these kind of flexible living arrangements for different types of family forms and so on. And uh, Stockholm, I think, is another city that also uses a gender mainstreaming lens. And I, I think I talk about in my book how Stockholm uses a gender planning lens to think about things like where they plow the snow from the streets first, which is something you might not immediately think of when you think of a feminist city. But of course, which spaces are barrier free is, is a gendered issue. And we know in many cities, we plow the snow away from um, major freeways and car routes, and we leave pedestrian areas and residential streets and school zones to the last. And I don't think you need too much imagination to see how that might break down on gendered lines in terms of who is trapped in their home during a snowstorm and who's able to get to work. So uh, you'll notice that those are European cities that I've mentioned. I think gender mainstreaming approaches have had more traction in European cities over the last several decades, but it's something that can be uh, really applied to any city. Um, yeah, I, I, I was just recalling the heavy snowfalls uh, back in Poland this winter. And what was really um, great for me was that the city I live in, Krakow, decided to put the snow aside first from the sidewalks to the streets to avoid Car, um, uh, car movement and to enable people to walk freely, especially the elderly and mothers with children, because they knew that the, those people need to move around and do their whereabouts. So I'm just now uh, kind of um, raised <laughs> that, uh, you know, uh, up, up broad, so to say, that my city is thinking um, um, like f with, uh, for the future. Um, you, you were also men, uh, mentioning that um, changing the way we think should involve many more women in the design teams or uh, in the design um, um, governance, so to say. We have people being called chief design officers for the cities and um, there is still something um, applied to change. That change can be either radical or it can be... A, evolutionary. Still, with both those perspectives, we need leaders that would be certain that those change changes needs to be implemented. Where do you find such leaders? Well, another great question. I wish I um, had the obvious answer to that. But I, I think it's important maybe for cities to think outside of the box in terms of who might be brought into those positions. So we probably have a long history of just hiring other bureaucrats into new bureaucratic roles, right? These things yeah. tend to kind of reproduce themselves in, in terms of who gets looked at and who gets hired and what sorts of qualifications are assumed to be the ones that matter. But I wonder if we looked to bringing in members of activist communities, people who are on the front lines of leading movements like Black Lives Matter or climate change movements and brought them to have a seat at the table, even if they are not the chief design officer, but if they're one of the team of people who are consulting about the changes that might happen in a city, whether they're around equality, whether around sustainability and the way those two things might be linked even having those sorts of voices because those people have a lot of experience and they have a lot of vision and they're not confined by what they understand to be what we can do in a city or by um, a focus on this kind of incremental 
change. They may have more radical visions that, sure, maybe we can't do them overnight, but at least being able to think of them, being able to imagine what different futures could look like is important for taking those first incremental or evolutionary steps in that right direction. Uh, it's great that you mentioned different futures because as we know there is no one future and you can obviously design your own future but you need to be sure sure what what you want in the end what is the ultimate goal you want to uh, achieve then you can draw different scenarios and choose one for you but I think the most important thing as far as city planning is concerned and the and is geography and this is my bet that you need to have other voices heard other than white men, uh, like uh, a strong white man who tries to move around the city in his car and get to the office and then safely to the uh, to his garage under the, uh, the apartment. I'm obviously joking, but this is the perspective we are facing now living in the cities. Uh, I was also touched actually touched by the um, by the attention you draw to the future plan um, based on house and housing and care work you give such a strong um, notice to the care work and to, to people who organize the care work and who provide it who are basically invisible in the city and to whom the um, the borders the um, the disruptions and the difficulties are extremely harmful and actually enabling them to function in a city um, can you say something more about that how you view the caregivers and the care work um, as a as a um, part of a city and uh, um, the feminist geography? Sure. So this has really been heightened for me throughout the pandemic. It was certainly something that I thought about before, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, Feminist City. But during the pandemic, I think uh, many people, not just feminist geographers, but many people have started to notice, as you say, those workers, both paid workers and unpaid workers in the home, notice their labor, to notice the people who have been invisible upon whose work we really rely just to stay alive, to stay fed, to have our basic needs met as human beings. And those include people in all sorts of caring professions outside of the home, whether those are in healthcare and education and um, caring for the elderly and so on. And it also includes all of the unpaid care work that is typically made invisible in the home because the home is considered a private space. We have so much focus, as I said, on a single family, nuclear family homes that this labor falls often onto the, the shoulders of individual women in those homes. And so many stories from the pandemic of people um, noticing how their uh, male partners don't do nearly um, an equitable share of housework, childcare, homeschooling, helping out with elderly parents, all of those sorts of tasks. And we've seen in countries like Canada and the US, for example, hundreds of thousands of women being pushed out of the workforce over the last few years in a, a wave that may have kind of a generational setback effect on women's economic uh, equality. And this has a, a lot to do with the way that still in 2021, women still do a disproportionate share of care work. So what does this mean for cities? Um, I think it, it means that we do need to think about different ways of organizing the home and how we organize care work. Women have been talking about this for centuries, coming up with ideas for housework collectives, coming up with ideas for uh, shared housing and co-housing, coming up with ideas for, um, you know, outsourcing the care work of the home. Of course, we have seen that happen, but it has tended to be mm, play into some global divisions of labor where women from the developing world come to first world nations to do the work of nannying and, and housekeeping for very low wages, which is also problematic in many ways. But what I'm getting at is that Yes, in thinking of the city of the future in terms of care work, we have to reimagine the home. We have to reimagine care work as something that we engage in as a public activity, not just as a private activity. And we also have to think about how we could reorganize our transportation networks to include 
care work as a priority for where people have to go and what they need to do. And we might also think about how we could use our public spaces in different ways, whether they're spaces for education and play for children, whether they're spaces where we collectively feed people, whether they're um, spaces where other kinds of care work can be brought into the public sphere rather than hidden away in the, the private single family home. I see a lot of uh, work to be done here. And I also wondered that while planning those scenarios, that we will see different people in different roles in in care work, that we should also find a man as a center uh, character, not as a helper, as we tend to uh, name a, ro a man's role at home, that he's a help. I, I mean, like like everything that we do at home would be our responsibility and we only can get help, no, not as we would um, divide it equally, that this is my part and this is your part. So I think that the main character of the future city scenario is again men, but the perspective is totally different, that he's given a new chance to stand as a person that really takes responsibility for how the city is being used by the people and how it serves them instead of serving only one interest. And um, this uh, this uh, drives me to the question um, about the ideal city. And most recently, Space 10 and Gestaltet, um, they have released a book in which they describe the ideal city. And they have given five features for the ideal city, saying that it should be resource resourceful, safe, accessible, shared and desirable. Do you think that those characteristics are enough to say that the city is ideal? Well, I think the, the one thing, at least one thing that is missing from that list would be equitable. The city should be equitable in terms of people's access to all of those other qualities. However, I, I do think it's it's a good list, but of course, like any a uh, list of terms like that, the way that you interpret them or the way that you would go about making them kind of manifest in, in reality will have a lot to do with who is at that table, right? So what does accessibility look like? Well, that depends very much on all sorts of different factors. So are you going to make sure, for example, that the disabled community is at the forefront of deciding what accessibility really looks like? When we think about sharing and, and what that means. Are we going to make sure that the people who are most marginalized and most excluded from access to good urban resources are part of that conversation? Safety, I think, is another key issue. Safety looks very different for different sorts of communities in the city. And as you were mentioning earlier, thinking about policing, if safety become synonymous with increased policing, well, that might make some people feel safe while others are actually much less safe under those circumstances. So to me, I think these are potentially great qualities, but it's going to depend a lot on who the people are who would actually uh, turn these qualities into tangible features of the built environment. So again, needing to broadly consult with different groups and make sure that people who have historically been excluded from these conversations are brought to the table. And if you were to describe your ideal feminist city, the place that you would like to live in, it would be? Well, I would love to live in a city where I think care work is a forethought, not an afterthought in the city. So in tangible terms, this would look like having all sorts of flexible housing arrangements and flexible caregiving arrangements. It would mean that there's free childcare and free education. It would mean that there is free public transportation that's accessible to all different areas of a city. It would mean that the waged care labor that is done, again, largely by women, immigrants, people of color in many of our cities is well paid, that you earn a, a living wage from that work and that that work is valued. Right now, much of this work is stigmatized or it's seen as a lesser kind of work, not as highly skilled or intellectual labor. So how could we take away that stigma and really see this work as um, the, the true thing that really powers this 
entity that we call the economy. Without this care work, there is no economy. So to me, that's the kind of city that I would like to live in. Okay. And I have also a set of other questions uh, that are like uh, questions to be filled, uh, fill in the gap, <laughs> so to sure. say. So uh, I'd like to ask you what your inspiration is, saying my inspiration is in my inspiration is in my students who aren't afraid to stand up to powerful institutions and who know very clearly that their future is on the line and they're ready to make a difference. And a friendship is about? Friendship is about your chosen family and valuing relationships beyond the confines of romantic partnership. And sisterhood is about? Sisterhood is about respecting all women, uh, but at the same time, recognizing our differences in terms of power, privilege, and identity. And the very last question, when I think about the future, I? When I think about the future, I don't often feel optimistic. I don't see us addressing the climate crisis quickly enough, but I do think that there is a generation of activists who are demanding a different world, and that gives me hope. Leslie, thank you for this conversation. I hope that our uh, listeners will know where to look for the feminist city and also will get a chance to um, get your book. And uh, I hope we'll one day meet in a, in a city that really cares about the needs of all people living in it. Thank you very much for having you. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me here. You are listening to the Futures Thinking Podcast, where futures meet present. Powered by Greenhead Innovation and 360inspiration.nl.